Thanks very much for a very interesting uh, uh, speech. Um, Paul Sweeney from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Um, you said rightly at the beginning that the European social model has been has greatly mitigated the, the deep recession that we faced. But I would put it to you that it's under threat and it's been put on the back burner by, by your colleagues in the Commission who are pushing this competitiveness agenda using the crisis. Uh, which is a financial crisis, to, they're, they're spending more time addressing labour market reform than dealing with the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the problems in, in the financial, uh, you know, financial reform and so on. Uh, and uh, this is to our cost. And I think it's, it's reducing people's um, uh, uh, positive attitude towards Europe. Are we collecting or? Um, oh, to, okay. Uh, well, it's it's uh, difficult to tell what actually uh, what is actually on the agenda of the Commission and what uh, fills the headline, the front pages of the newspapers. There is a lot of uh, talk, uh, and especially, for example, in the first quarter of this year, there was a lot of talk about competitiveness because of this attempted competitiveness pact, which was later transformed into a Euro Plus pact. But uh, since uh, the Commission came to office, there has been a very strong agenda for uh, rebuilding financial regulation, for example. It was something which uh, I think the previous Commission could have also done. It didn't happen. Uh, in a way, it, 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 it could have. And in a way, um, uh, Michel Barnier uh, took this very seriously and, and brought this forward in several steps to build up a an all-European financial regulatory system with three uh, centers in, um, in a very uh, robust uh, way. Uh, there is fundamentally, in terms of uh, its origin and the consequences, a financial uh, crisis. But um, I think it also uh, exposed much of the weaknesses of the European economy. And I think it's, it cannot be doubted that in some countries these weaknesses are related to competitiveness and the very low growth potential. So I don't think there are kind of uniform policies because there are some countries which, which don't have much competitiveness problems, like, for example, Germany or the Netherlands. Uh, the, the, you know, some countries are happily exporting and, uh, and don't, uh, you know, the Commission is not uh, applying a kind of straight jacket of policies uh, while there is a great diversity of conditions and, uh, and capacities. But where it is relevant, I think, uh, I think we shouldn't escape discussing the problems of competitiveness and, and improve it if possible. Who else? <coughs> yes. Ambassador here in Dublin, <coughs> and I would like to ask a question uh, related to the implementation. You will not be surprised uh, to the implementation of the principle of uh, freedom of movement in the labor area. Uh, <coughs> you are very well aware, Commissioner, that uh, <coughs> Bulgarian citizens, as also the Romanian citizens, uh, continue to experience. Uh, labor restrictions in accessing the labor markets of several uh, <coughs> European countries, uh, especially the old member countries. So I wanted to hear your view now, five years after the accession of Bulgaria and Romania, because the restrictions for the first 10 have been lifted uh, happily. Uh, <coughs> the restrictions for Bulgarians and Romanians are in their fifth year now. <coughs> and uh, they will be subject to review <coughs> in uh, this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could be also extended for another two years. Now, do you believe uh, there, is a, there is a rationale in extending these, uh, these restrictions for additional two years? And do you believe that lifting them this year will actually uh, bring some uh, distortion to the labor markets in the old European member states. Thank you. 
Uh, what I can say is that uh, indeed uh, the free movement of uh, workers and related social security coordination was part of my discussion uh, with the minister this morning. And uh, indeed there are many uh, aspects, many dimensions of this uh, topic. In the recent period we had uh, uh, an important date which was the 1st of May when the restriction expired for the countries that joined the EU in 2004 in Austria and Germany. And uh, these discussions, also the ones in Austria and Germany, showed that uh, these countries may have had some kind of concern beforehand, but now uh, the majority is looking at these opportunities very positively. And uh, that's what uh, was actually supported by the Commission's own analysis as well, that for the individuals involved, for the countries uh, uh, that are the countries of destination uh, in this free movement, and also the countries of origin, in case these workers come back later with greater experience and uh, you know, having learned the working culture, gaining experience in a more competitive economy, they can also benefit the home environment at a, at a later stage. So the Commission has been uh, very clearly, without any ambiguity, stressing the benefits of uh, free movement. And, um, and what I think is um, that uh, uh, countries that maintain restriction vis-a-vis -vis Bulgaria, Romania, uh, may be able to reconsider their timetable uh, if their experience is positive with the recent opening. I, I encourage, I have encouraged uh, them uh, to do so. Of course, it's their right uh, to apply the rules because I think it's important to know that the same rules apply for Romania and Bulgaria as the rules that had applied uh, to the countries that joined in 2004, and the same rules will apply in the forthcoming period to Croatia, also once Croatia is joining the European Union. Irish Times. Thank you, Dan O'Brien, the Irish Times newspaper. You, you seem to endorse the reversal of the uh, reduction in the minimum wage in, in your speech. Uh, if that's the case, what was the Commission's position six months ago when the financial assistance package was being negotiated? It, it was understood at that time that the Commission advocated the lowering of the minimum wage. There seems to be a, a very big change over six months in the Commission's position. Could you elaborate on it? I'm uh, sure it was not the Commission alone which approached uh, Ireland. Ireland uh, was in a situation uh, uh, when, when um, the government had to request external support uh, for financial stabilization and avoid uh, uh, worse options. And uh, the uh, Commission, the IMF, the European Central Bank, were partners in developing uh, the, the crisis response and uh, the package of measures that uh, were implemented. And uh, I think this is not the only example. Uh, I'm sure there are other ones. Look at, for example, the question of the interest rate in the case of Greece, when in subsequent periods there can be uh, a different approach and uh, and uh, it's not uh, the concept of the automatic pilot to to drive through the the, the financial uh, turbulence. It's uh, I think a process when there is a need to revisit, reconsider various factors, and if there is a possibility, uh, we also need to work for better standards and uh, protecting the most vulnerable groups. In this case, the minimum wage is clearly an important element of the whole wage setting uh, mechanism. It protects many workers from falling into poverty and uh, maintaining an effective uh, minimum wage, in my view, is a very important um, uh, instrument. Uh, even if not every EU member state applies uh, a minimum wage, but uh, my uh, 
my uh, approach is, uh, is very positive, although you should um, also see that uh, there is no European legislation on uh, minimum wage. Uh, the Commission has an understanding and a view about the use of the minimum wage, but it's not something that the EU would set for the member states. Right. Um, you, oh, yes, we'll take one. We're running short on time. Okay. Kevin, you take one on, on, on this one I want okay. to ask, but maybe you're thank going you. to ask. Thank you, Kevin O'Kelly, uh, Commissioner. Thank you very much for your presentation. Another area uh, which I don't think you touched on very much in your uh, address. Uh, is the pensions issue and the pensions problems across uh, uh, across many, many member states, including here in Ireland. Uh, I know there was a green paper last year and the consultation process uh, went on uh, up until the end of November. Um, and you're proposing, or the Commission is proposing to issue a communique sometime later this year. Uh, this year. And I was wondering, do you have any early thoughts on what might be in that uh, communique and what role the Commission might play in the coordination of pensions policy? Yes, uh, thank you much. Uh, I uh, have uh, some early thoughts, of course, some advanced thoughts uh, as well, because this uh, consultation on the basis of the Green Paper was really rich and uh, brought a lot of uh, comments. It confirms much of the preliminary views mm -hmm. Uh, we had uh, with Commissioners Rehn and Barnier, who were also partners in developing in this Green Paper, and they remain partners in developing the White Paper, which will come out later uh, this year. Um, of course, I could not, uh, I'm, I'm not in a position to uh, tell you about the substance of the White Paper, but since uh, the consultation concluded with certain uh, uh, focus and statements which I already presented to the EBSCO Council. Uh, there are a few initiatives which are forthcoming and they have a strong uh, relevance in the Irish context as well. One of them is about the safety of pensions, especially if we want to encourage more savings uh, for people for old age. And uh, this is, of course, handled by the financial sector, uh, which did not always turn out to be very resilient and stable in the recent period. I think it's very important to see, to look at what needs to be done for a higher level of financial stability in order to ensure that the investments in pension funds are safe and people at an old age will enjoy uh, the benefits of uh, their savings. So this is something Michel Barnier is working on and he will take the initiative at a due uh, course. And the other one I would like to mention, uh, which is absolutely relevant uh, because it's linked to uh, labor mobility in the EU, that's the portability of the occupational pensions. We will have to come back to this following the white paper, uh, but uh, it's already crystal clear that there is enormous support and huge demand for uh, the Commission uh, coming forward with a legislative initiative on portability of pension, because this is one of the sometimes hidden, sometimes unhidden obstacles uh, before uh, uh, labor mobility. And um, we are obviously uh, not just researching the topic, but uh, we have carried out some negotiations and continue uh, to do so. And. Um, and uh, uh, there will be probably next year an initiative about this. I'm going to abuse the privileges of the chair, as I say, to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned uh, in your remarks a statistic that has been repeated again and again by the Commission, that there are 80 million citizens in the European Union who are at risk or within poverty. Last year was the European year uh, to combat poverty. Could you comment on, on what your initial conclusions from that year are and, and, and where you would place the priority in, in, in dealing with this huge social problem. I just might say that I personally was involved many, many years ago with the then Irish Minister for Social Welfare in, in the introduction of the first European poverty programme back in the 70s uh, when uh, Patrick Hillary was your predecessor as, as Social Affairs Commissioner. So I have a, a personal feeling about this. but. The statistic is, is a very stark one in the context of, of, of 
the union with the social dimension that it has always underlined. So perhaps you might just comment on, on what came out of that year and, and, and where you see it guiding you in, in the future. Well, the European year uh, helped to raise awareness of the problem because uh, uh, we know that Europe is one of the richest parts of the world, but uh, we often forget that there are a lot of people at least at risk of poverty, but uh, some in material deprivation and various forms of uh, deep uh, poverty. And uh, it also helped this uh, European campaign to mobilize uh, civil society. Mm. There were plenty of programs really involving uh, uh, social workers and charities and various organizations which need uh, uh, to kind of revitalize their activities and re-energize uh, uh, themselves. And I think we have been helping that. And further than that, uh, I think this uh, European year helped delivering uh, two important uh, uh, products, one of them, the poverty target in Europe 2020, uh, which I think yes. was very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other one is the, as part of the 2020 strategy, the European Platform Against Poverty and Social Exclusion, which will uh, uh, contribute to the annual European semester. Uh, exercise and, and the monitoring of the progress with poverty reduction will form part of uh, uh, this exercise every year. The question is what indicators we follow. Mm -hmm. And we had enormous discussions one year ago about the right indicators um, uh, about poverty or the risk of poverty. Uh, in the previous period, there was uh, uh, perhaps not a bias, but a kind of convention that the at-risk of poverty, uh, relative poverty indicator should be there, which is the 60% of the median uh, income. And uh, these discussions actually uh, resulted in a more pluralistic understanding of uh, poverty. Also because you know, we needed to respond to the diversity of economic and social reality uh, in the European Union. So now the national reform programs um, uh, and, and the national poverty targets are based on uh, a choice and a possible combination of at risk of poverty, material deprivation, and the jobless households. So the countries can design their own anti-poverty programs along their choice of these, whatever they find most relevant uh, in that context. For example, where there are more developed social services, which also cover uh, poor people. Uh, there's less relevance of uh, the financial uh, poverty index of, uh, or the income-based poverty index uh, by, for example, in much of the so-called new member states, uh, measuring material deprivation is absolutely relevant. Although these indices can also be kind of revised and further developed. So we are uh, now working on that basis, and uh, I can say the same, that this morning I also had an opportunity to discuss uh, uh, the Irish ambition uh, concerning poverty reduction with the Minister. Thank you for that.